a little bit of, uh, of talking right now just to to set some stuff up but so y'all know but we're really we're really excited with juice we're, we're happy to be here but for real it's gonna be some fire in these pins and in the bars that you're gonna hear from folks and if y'all got some questions throw it in the chat let's talk on what y'all get from the pieces because speaking for myself and i think speaking for my my folks uh, we write because we got something to say and we want this to to resonate with the people who are going to hear the work we want it to inspire the people we're trying to educate we're trying to empower the people so what y'all hear and what y'all receive on the other end is extremely important to us and that's part of how we build community especially from the culture that we come from that the power of our language our spoken word and especially the revolutionary power of it is extremely important especially in a time like we live in right now so i've done a whole bunch of talking let's get to some bars who's trying who's trying to go y'all y'all waiting for me to to set it off is that is that how it is azari i, I ain't seen nothing you am i i gotta set it off are you setting it off how about we do that because azari is the youngest Y'all want to put it on Azaria like that? I guess so. Y'all don't have to force me. Extra, go ahead and take the heat. Um, I'm Ms. Shepherd. Um, I'm the 2016 Open Youth Poet Laureate. I serve as a teaching fellow and a mentor. I'm a college student. Um, if you have other questions, I guess you can ask me. I'm pretty straightforward. Um, and so y'all gonna get some new stuff today. I just started writing it really interesting. Um, here we go. I've determined that I have abandonment issues. Often wonder why this rose grew in an untended garden, why only thing poured here was rain. Why tears the only moisture this soil knows. I wonder why the blood of lost sisters and the BS we deal with doubles as fertilizer. Wonder why new petals grow in place of the thorns we anticipate and why I keep leaving myself unguarded. Welcome to Eden. Watch how the wilted flowers water each other. Our roots are woven to hold each other up and you interpret this as basket case. This basket carry our burdens and his and theirs. We bear the weight of the world on these shoulders. Grow in the shadows of weeping willows, black women often the strange fruit. Y'all only here to lick up the sap. It's odd how the succulent so supple when suffocated like the rest of us can't find the space to breathe, still struggling to survive yet so rich, sir. Please stay off of the yellow brick road. Excuse me, sir. I said, please stay off the yellow brick road for so easy for folks to get distracted by golden po poppies, distracted by golden poppies, distracted by golden poppies. My pain, euphoric. Our photosynthesis, their trauma porn. The voyeurs watch the Venus fly traps as they shut their mouths for the sake of survival. Love it when we quiet. Never know full bloom. Never know full truth of the matter. Quick to call us hope for flourishing. Shoveling your opinions down our throats, constantly taking digs at us, but, digs at us, but we planted on solid ground. Do you see the cracks in the concrete? Is that where flowers supposed to grow? I wonder. Why no gladiolas grow here? I thought you said joy cometh in the morning. The resilient morning glories can't just grow anywhere and ain't no sunshine will be gone. So how some flowers forced to grow in the dark? How day look like night and there was no night in shining armor to save me, but y'all need us to survive. We the air you breathe, we feed the food you eat and I am left and we are left and we are left feasting on our hopes and dreams of freedom. Welcome to Eden. We the flowers and the fruit. You pick and choose which ones to protect which ones to patronize, pretty ones are partaken in, nice enough for a bouquet, fragrant enough to improve any home, gifted and left to die. Don't realize the pain caused when we cut to the core, put down we don't suck up, you realize everybody in jasmine a honeysuckle. I ain't sweet enough, ain't palatable enough, we swallowed whole and regurgitated, it's revolting even. We rooted in the name of regeneration, birthing new generations, we give you life. We water the seeds you plant and sometimes abandon. We shed the dead weight, leaving behind dying petals and wonder why we barren. Yet we still thrive like the walnut tree. Heavy even when we stand empty and alone, everything you need is provided here. And yet you still eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Know that loving us ain't a sin, but you treat it like one. Serpents plague the snake plants. You were deceived, but we suffer daily. Welcome to Eden. Exile is our self-defense. Welcome to Eden. And yet you still welcome here. Must be the grace of God. While we continue to go missing, you can find us in the untended garden. Thank you. <laughs> that That's how you gonna hit us with the new stuff, Azaria? Yes. Dang. Dang, well, all right, that, uh, you had you had that one scheme. You, what did you hit with a whole bunch of, with the alliteration, with the S's, the supplement, supplement. My bad, I'm, I'm getting- Oh, you want me to go back to it? Yeah, yeah, you hit with that succulent, supple. Some, How the succulent so supple when suffocated like the rest of us? <laughs> um, 
And so basically, I guess I can explain to you the theory behind this poem. So this poem was actually born out of a free write. I had been stagnant for a while and hadn't been writing. And so my friend challenged me to do like a stream of consciousness every day until I produce something. And so one day somebody said something to me about succulents and it just kept replaying in my head. And then somebody else said black women are snake plants and that kept replaying in my head. And so finally, I just sat down and started writing. And so it started, it was for Women's History Month. Um, well, it started off as just a free write, but then it turned into a commission for Women's History Month performance that I just did. Um, and so the goal is to basically talk about how, all if you look at or listen to all of the different types of plants that are mentioned within the poem, these are often some of the most untended plants, but often the most beautiful of all of them. So you have walnut trees who produce a lot, but are barren. You have snake plants who can deal with no water and survive in the harshest of conditions because they have to, they're expected to thrive. And so these are things that are deemed low maintenance. These are the things that people add to their garden because they don't require a lot of attention. And so then you think about how black women function within society and how we're forced to be these unwatered and untended plants in a lot of situations and how we have to still show up and still look beautiful and still maintain ourselves because that's what the world needs, but nobody's really checking on us except for each other. We crying and that's how we water and pour into each other, we cry. And so that's really what the theory behind the poem was. I hope that y'all were able to grasp some of those things from that. Okay, we are back. Sorry about that. All right, it's all good. Well, if y'all cool with it, <clears throat> I'm gonna go because uh, I like the fact that Azaria was saying this was some new stuff and you know like we, we could talk about that as writers how it goes I mean Tongo sometimes I think you just stay in the the pain game I know for me there'll be extended periods of time when I don't write nothing but I'm absorbing experiences you know what I'm saying and then I know when it's ready when it's time to write I'm ready to go so I probably hadn't written anything for maybe like three, four years. And I remember Tongo, we was at, we was at that, um, bro, where was we? We was at one of those events. I can't remember where it was at, but he was like, bro, you need to stay on your pen game. I was like, yeah, man, my bad. And I hadn't been writing. Cause my, my style is I'm an MC before I consider myself a poet. And the way that I was brought up in MCing, we didn't write, it was just all improv. It was all freestyle. So we would literally just be freestyling. So it was a, it was a, different approach for me to go from freestyling to actually writing and in order for me to write I still got a freestyle so I, I try to dedicate five to ten minutes a day to just throw on a couple images and just go that's how I keep my game as sharp as I can so when I'm out of practice I got a freestyle and it takes me probably like six to eight months of daily practice to get to a place where I'm real confident in what I'll put on paper because I feel my game is right. <clears throat> so I went through an extended period of time of not doing that, then started practicing, and then started feeling my pen come back to me. So one of the first things that I wrote uh, after feeling like I'm ready to write was a piece that I released last year called Black Mirror. It's a song. I'm just going to recite verse one for you, and we'll see where we go out with that. So Black Mirror verse one, I say, the situation is systemic. Every injury that they've inflicted has been intended through the colonies and constitution they engineered and invented multiple ways to keep us forcibly enslaved and hold us indentured. The resistance I amplify is endemic of a people to whom freedom has been their only incentive. Since the placenta, my ancestors been insisting that we get this devil off our neck where he'd been sitting. It's so reminiscent of George Floyd. We broadcast live from the land of the Iroquois. It's occupied territory, Cali to Illinois. These colonizers use their white God, money and guns to fill a void. That's why my tribe rising up when my vocal hit that solenoid, spilling only the realest noise, sounded like something from the pages of W.E.B. Du Bois in Ghana, next to Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, or something from the pages of books written by Wallace Dean Muhammad's father, the Honorable Elijah, 
It's message to the black man, black woman, black child, however you identify revolution, the only way that we all survive. To y'all, I testify and tell no lies. Your boy been pushing the same line since 1159, that freedom reborn, ghetto Messiah. I speak to unify, electrify to get the oxen line, sipping my alkaline with Malcolm on my mind. That's verse one, Black Mirror. Do you feel me? Yeah, yeah. all right, <laughs> right on. So yeah, I, I see we got uh we got unit unit one in here, unit two, unit four, five, six. I hope y'all y'all hear us over there. You know what I'm saying? We got some, we got some bars for the people today. But yeah, that was a uh, Azari. You you inspired me to want to share that because that was one of the first pieces that I had written in a long time, and I I felt that. We love to see it. I might do all new stuff today. Okay, go ahead, bring bring it brand new. You know what I'm saying? It's all good. So y'all real shy on the other end in the chats and stuff. Go ahead, feel free. Y'all can throw some stuff in there. Some questions, comments is good. Uh, our poets on here. Y'all do whatever. Let's let's keep it going. Let's keep the energy moving. But y'all not moving. <laughs> so what's up? Azari, you want to go? Joy, it's on you or something. Tongo is good. Re, all right. Let's go. Let's get, let's get the people something. Um, you can tell by my tires that not everybody who's driven with me is still alive. Also, that I like my drinks neat bottled and in a bus stop. Also, that we're drowning in precinct paper, department store floor plans and applications to the moon. Uh, we can change the color of our snot from gifted to heart attack and tell you about ashes, but where are all these angels coming from? Smelling like the cigarette that fails. And why is the man on the safe side? These headlights freezing up. You got nothing to say at my funeral. I'll speak on your behalf. Heroin in my smile. Mountain made a flatland robbery among some things on my mind. The last store run in the name of shared afterlife. Friday to the filter. I'm a talk tale on earth. But here's to that angel that never appeared to America. And the night a dog paddling a batch of hangovers looking for a home. You know, a lot wouldn't have lived this long. That's my human when fences speak. On a pair of rambling dice that got unique tempers and young souls that say shut up about our city here. Title months crash over a coast while a lot of streets teeth are in pieces. There's reservoir art on the faces of stragglers. There's sad news from back home to me. We have to grow up on his behalf. Stumble back to a car full of last stand. The truth is stale, but still liquor. Mission Street will be proud of me. I'm a mural man, almost organized. Remember when my lungs would wake up last walking on morning. If it was worth it, man, I am three decades homeless. And reservoir art is all I ever see. And I'm 2,000 miles from my first fight. Maybe no one really survived. Maybe I wrote my first poem for no reason. A tour guide through your robbery, I also am. Cigarettes saying, look what I did about your silence. Ransom water and box spring gold. This decade is only for accent and grooming, I guess. Ransom water and box spring gold. The corner store must die. War games, I guess. All these tongues run as junk. You know, the start of mass destruction begins and ends in restaurant bathrooms that some people use and other people clean. You telling me it's a rag in the sky? Waiting for you. Yes, we've written the scene. We set a stage. You know, we should have fit in. Warehouse jobs with communists, but now more corridor and hallway have walked into our lives. Now the whistling is less playful and the barbed wire overcrowded too, my dear. If it is not a city. Tango, you're muted. How long I've been muted? The whole time? No, like maybe 20 seconds. Oh, uh, somebody muted me on accident. I, 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 I do hope that. not. <laughs> I'll put it I'll put it another way. Uh, you know, guided by teeth goes this country. There's a cow's mouth on the flag. A peculiar notepad holds street life dear, but the writer's not here. He's somewhere talking to tombstones about the good old days of splashing reborn water on his latest face. Or wondering how his old gun is doing in the afterlife, wondering how much death trap is in those gas station houses. It's gotta be a million dollars a day on this concrete island. New engine in the moon, why it never goes down. I mean, 72 straight hours of night, at least according to everyone's posture around here. 8.30 in the morning is really 30 minutes of closing. The city shuts down for a sleepy rat race. The elevator shoe shuffle to the nearest heaven, laugh and rest the whole way up. There are scabs everywhere. In puddles of city, 
in concentrated schools and TV lit warm rooms. You know, the light reveals military fatigue when it hits just right on the ties that are wrapped around the necks of lazy white guys. Empire is too easy, baby. Chant at the walls all summer if you feel like it. Best way for a target to move was shooting back, running for a tree line made of freeways. Wisdom says against a war machine on Tuesday, you stand no chance, but may we be the last poor people to play a safe cow's mouth on the flag. A politician raises his hand and the crowd shows their teeth. An oligarch raises his hand, little kids are not safe outside. You all high depressing comrades and function. 15 minutes of closing in the city has survived another black rebellion. We just paying dues by trash fires, not just anybody can set. Don't you love how deadly things whisper in a moment and people kill like feathers fall while everybody screaming inside the rider knows that death is not a matter of dignity rather humor in a house that smells like road traces nuclear percentages on torn stoves i mean here life never was just lazy matches and manic inhumanity hands rushing away from life towards those what we doing here surviving for no reason in particular because nobody gone far today nobody go far tomorrow trust me hell and heaven cannot count strange gardens where secondhand clothes play and concrete wishes to be human so that it could be accountable where they find you drenched and drains wish to be human so that they could be worthy arms for you to die and they greet them all grandson prepare for the day when every child is calm and don't say we ghosts didn't write you a poem don't say we didn't dig your life remember the shotgun by the coat rack that everybody in the house knows how to use Remember the tightrope made of needles for walking between driveways and man-made best friends. Go ahead, grandson. Tune the street again. Never mind this country. Kills musicians first. Broken neck night, scarred neck life. These walls could write lyrics. They say, what's your angle, angel eyes? 30, 50 rounds pass by on the street with no daughters. This street has no sons. Just young prisoners of war in a racist city that means to make capital. And we know so much. We know it all. We were stood against walls. Who's on the third cross around here? Cow's mouth salivating over the street. And that is the story of why we aim at teeth. <laughs> so we got a question in the chat that I want to pass around to you all. Where do poets find the strength to keep writing? There you go, Tongo, you're up. I'm up. Where where do uh, poets find the what? The, the strength, strength to keep writing. The strength to keep. Well, there's a there's a there's a few angles. I think you know uh, poetry is just a it's just a parallel um, intelligence, um, and so just you know just just as I'm just as as I'm determined, um, you know to to have my mind <laughs> on my on 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 my terms and 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 express what I want to express um this is just as I'm determined to went into secure just as I'm determined to you know to have a whole a whole human life and a whole human experience I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to have um poems um you know I mean, to me, it's it's you know, uh, well, one of the one of the uh, one one of the uh, 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 kind of bad things that happens to our minds or our consciousness along the way, and frankly, an oppressive society is we live in compartments internally. So we have like, this is me doing what I have to do. This is me doing what I want to do. This is me doing what my you know, what my family, you know, all these different categories of existence right but what what we actually deserve what's actually a human right is to live as one ha have one experience that has the full range you know and so poetry is a is a power of unifying these different aspects of ourselves and unifying them in our analysis of the world in our in the way the poem breaks down the world so that that's that's what that's what's at stake and and um you know that that's a power to to hold on to i, I see another question here what, what what what's the phrase um on your behalf uh you know really what is born of is is um understanding of the interconnectedness of all things so another problem <laughs> that goes along with kind of a, a consciousness that gets worked over by um gets worked over by by the status quo 
is we think of ourselves too individually, like 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 we think we look at our own individual adventures as the thing that we're doing, as opposed to understanding that we're part of a collective, uh, a, a you know, a whole, um, where whatever you want to look at it, whether it's a whole people, whole villages, this type of thing, right? And so when I say on your behalf, it's almost inevitable. One way or the other, no matter how how no matter how I want to, you know, how, no matter how I look at it, who I am and how I get down is an is an expression of the whole picture and affects the whole picture. So on, on your behalf is an acknowledgement of that. I'm scared to mute myself though, because I, I'm I, you know I don't want to get put back in the mute. <laughs> They had us on mute, super locked down for a second. Man. I think uh, anybody, anybody else has something to say. Any, yeah, anybody else want to speak on the, uh, the poetry stuff, the, where they, they get their strength from for that or any of the um, other things? I did want to say something. Um, I think Tongo really answered that question well. However, I also want to bring light to the fact like it's okay to not have the strength sometimes. And that's what I had to learn. Um, because there was like a period of my time after I became poet laureate where I was just like churning out poems and churning out poems. But when you're doing like performative poetry, whether it's for poetry competition like Poet Laureate or Brave New Voices, which is the international competition that I went to, there's a lot of obsession with trauma related poetry. And that can be very tolling. Um, and so sometimes you don't have the strength to write those poems. And so for me, I reached a point in like, 2017 where I was just like burnt out and I was like you know I'm spent I'm tired of writing poems and then I kind of got back into it for a little bit and then there was a three-year period where I maybe wrote a total of two poems out of that entire time and as somebody who was producing poems left and right to go from constantly producing and feeling like I have to produce to not producing anything and just being able to sit with how I feel and trying to navigate things it's a very large transition and so like Tango was saying, like we're all very human and we, we live a very compartmentalized life, but you have to think about like as poets, generally a poet errs to a certain style of poetry when they start writing. There's a lot of different styles of poetry that people grasp onto. However, um, there is an element where you wanna cross over those lines and you don't know how to. And so for me, I started writing from a place of pain and a place, a place of trauma. So now, even now trying to write poems about joy is something that I have not come to terms with. That's not something I've mastered yet. And it really requires you to be patient with yourself throughout the entire process, because sometimes you just literally will not have the strength, the gumption, the knowledge, the finesse, the understanding of how to produce the art that the world expects of you, especially when we're expected to be the creative spokespeople of the world. Like, how, how do you do that when you only know how to do one type of poem? And so that's really like my idea of it. It's it's not always something that you have the strength for and it requires a lot of patience and it's a consistent learning process. And it really forces you to grow outside of your comfort zone when you think about how often and how much you're trying to produce. And also you have to think about the fact, are you doing it for passion? Are you doing it for work? Or are you doing it because it's what's expected of you. Like, are you like, there's, th there's a lot of different subcategories to get broken into when it comes to the production of artwork. And I think that that's the other thing that you have to take into consideration when you ask about strength. It's sometimes it's not about strength, it's about obligation. Peace family. Uh, my name is Ree. So honored to be here with y'all. I just wanted to share a little bit. Thank you so much, sis, for all the just wisdom that you just dropped. I'm thinking about my own relationship to poetry and how I felt like I had to write for everybody else, but I didn't know how to write for myself. And so when I think about writing poems to perform and share with the world, that became like a pressure and it became a weight. I started writing poetry when I was 13 years old, trying to make sense of my sexual abuse and feeling like the responsibility to speak on behalf of every other black girl who had been violated, that became very overwhelming for me as a child. And now as a grown up, re-entering my relationship with creating and writing, y'all, I just got journals and journals of just writing. Like it don't gotta be a poem 
It don't have to be perfect. It don't have to be lyrical. It's just me trying to process my own life and my own relationship to my existence as a Black woman in this world. And that has been so freeing and so liberating. So I want to encourage y'all. I know y'all are dope, amazing writers, and you don't have to perform all the time. You don't always have to share your work. Some of my favorite, most beautiful pieces of writing are from my secret pages in my diary that I'll never show anyone. And that is what gives me the strength and the courage to share the pieces that are for the world. And knowing that if I just have one poem every five years for the world that's going to be okay my writing is still valid my voice is still valid and I don't have to feel hyper responsible to give so much of my creative um power to the world I, I my first priority as a writer is to give my words to myself and to witness my own suffering through my writing process if I can do that then everything else is just secondary I want to add to that. Um, my name is Joy Lan, and I'm a poet, author, writer, all that. Um, really, I'm a writer first. And I want to highlight that writing for me, you know, I grew up reading books and, you know, struggling with the idea that a lot of these stories I cannot relate to. I can't relate to Cinderella, I'll, although that's my favorite story. Story, I started writing for me. And then writing poetry uh, was a quick way for me for therapy. Um, I didn't have to share it with everybody else. You know, uh, but then when I put together a book, uh, you know, um, my first book was a, a bunch of poems from when I was in college up until I became a mother. And I felt like maybe my story could, it could be relatable to other women, other people. And that's how I came into writing my first book. But it came from my experiences and I struggle with, am I comfortable sharing this maybe intimate moment with someone else, with the world? And, you know, I said, at my first book, I put myself out there and then I realized again, like everybody else is saying, sometimes, especially when you get into the spoken word, open mic atmosphere, you start writing for the audience and you're not writing for yourself anymore. And that can drain you. Like, I don't know how, because now I'm putting on this performance. This is Joy Lan, the poet, you know, the perfectionist in a sense. I'm rehearsing all the time. And I'm not coming from sharing vulnerability as much anymore. Now I'm, it's about performing for everybody else. So I can drain you. And I, I haven't really, I haven't wrote a poem in so long. I shifted to different genres. Um, I started writing blogs and um, writing just capturing real stories in a form of like an article because I realized poetry took a lot of me, but I still love writing. So I just channeled my, I changed the genre of my writing style. But that happens, you know. And if it's all right with you, um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and perform a piece. Um, so uh, speaking of writing for blogs, um, I'm an activist, I'm a teacher, um, I'm, I live in Oakland, born and raised, never left. And um, I became very involved with the issue of gentrification, especially around the time when the Warriors first won the first finals. And then, you know, I started reading publications. And so I do my research before I start. And once I got gather all the research I have, then that's how I can put together a, a poem that relatable, not just for me, but for everybody else. Um, this poem is called Old Oakland versus New Oakland. And this was written in 2015, 2016, when I was tired of, you know, now Oakland is coming up, but when I've lived here and everybody else have lived here, same for people in San Francisco, you know, nothing was done when we were here, but now it's coming up. Um, it's getting attention, but we're being pushed out. That's what this poem is called. So Old Oakland versus New Oakland. I hope you like it. I hope you can relate to it. 
Every morning, Monday through Friday at 7.30, 580 West is jammed. From High Street heading to San Francisco, and Bart is packed like cans of sighting rooms. The city that once wasn't seen so pretty is being taken over by techies and businesses, pushing out longtime residents and erasing our traditions and cultures. We have to be quiet when we congregate because we're disturbing the peace. We've been here for over 40 years and we have to give up ourselves for them. We're making the neighborhood unsafe and unattractive. They may look like office spaces and homes and forcing everyone to conform to their ideas. We're part of our city, but we can't afford to live here. The land of Oak was once seen as a joke. Compared to San Francisco, we were the ghetto. America's number two city of homicides. We were seen as dangerous. But I guess we weren't so bad at all because we were invaded by people who have privilege. It was reversed of white flight. We have to move 30 minutes to an hour away commuting every day to go to work. We can't afford to live in Oakland when we work in Oakland. However, we're putting all this money into our commute. When we're in certain areas, we'll profile for being in the wrong area. Hold up, this was my, my neighborhood until you bought the property. Snitching slash facial profiling online on next door. Why don't they come out of their home, experience the cultures and meet the long-term residents before they displace us? I have to carry my freedom paper to prove I live here. It's technology versus art, white versus people of color, downtown slash uptown versus East Oakland. Oh wait, East Oakland is being taken over too. People don't recognize our sports teams, which are in East Oakland. The Raiders and A play at the Coliseum right next to the Oracle where the Warriors play, yet the NBA keeps showing the bay. The fans ride back to the game and back to their hidden home. Now they're relocating closer to San Francisco from the west to the east. I can't let them take over my city, but I don't have a choice. I use words in my voice. I have been here my whole life. My family have lived and worked here since the 60s. We give back to our community by living and working in it. They don't care and they redeveloping everything. But nothing was done when we were here, but they don't like it, so local government respond to their complaints. They ignore the people's cries who have been long-term residents. Things change by having money. I thought being a taxpayer gave me power. Nah, being a homeowner and paying property taxes give me power. The renters can't afford to live here, and well, while the property owners don't live in Oakland, they clean us out and get the ones with money in. My city doesn't look the same anymore, and it's not from diversity. And um, I want to add um, one of the beautiful things about writing is you get to be anonymous. Um, this, actually next week, May 2nd, will be three years that the article that I wrote about regarding Barbecue Becky that made it go viral, it will be its anniversary. So people don't know, I was the one who first covered the Barbecue Becky story. And that come, and that, if you read the original article before Channel 4 News got it, you'll see I knew Oakland's history, I knew our history. And that's what art is about. You take different pieces of information. I don't care if it's from the Black Panther Party newspaper, you had have, you have the artists from there, all different people. Um, you learn from them. You'd be surprised how much that comes through in your writing. And so I was able to really share the story of the people who are the natives of Oakland, how we've been struggling with Lake Merritt and trying to just coexist in this city as well as the Bay Area. Joy, could you explain the barbecue Becky phenomenon if there's viewers that aren't living in the Bay Area right now? Okay, so you probably seen this famous picture of a woman <laughs> um, with sunglasses on her cell phone. Um, she's been recorded at Lake Merritt. Um, so the barbecue Becky was the people it happened to actually were my editors for a blog. And so um, barbecue Becky, she accused the two men, the, they were uh, African-American men at the lake who just it, like, there is no rules and regulations for just setting up and barbecuing at the lake. Really there isn't. But the fact that she, thought that she could get 
these two black men basically in trouble. She called, she was on hold with the police. Um, fortunately, you know, I want to talk about in a sense, um, white allies, the husband, his wife was what is white. And she was the one filming the whole thing and they removed the two black men, which could have been, which I explained in my article that um, reduced the confrontation that could have happened if the police had showed up because now you're removing two black men out the picture and now it's two white women arguing. Um, but the wife um, basically filmed the whole encounter, the whole interaction. It was like a 20 something minute video. And, um, but that was like the spark of barbecuing by black, you know, um, here in um, Lake Med in, in Oakland. And it just, it was just our way of saying, this is a public park. Why can't we use it too, you know? So that's what Barbecue Becky was about. Thank you for explaining. Thank you, Dory. And thank you to all the other poets who have shared their work. Um, I'm gonna jump in and share a piece as well, y'all. Um, just wanna first say I'm calling in really heavy, like with everything that's happening. I don't know if y'all have heard about the story of uh, Micaiah Bryant, 16 year old black girl who was killed by the police in Ohio. And, um, I'm dedicating this poem to her. It's really about my experience um, feeling unprotected as a Black girl who was abused and thinking about all the ways that Black girls remain unprotected um, from a series of layered violences, right? Uh, my poem is about sexual abuse, and so I just want to say trigger warning for that and also just realizing that whether it's physical abuse sexual abuse um murder violence like all the ways that black girls and black women um experience ongoing harm that often goes under under discussed and particularly black girls who experience what folks call adultification, meaning you're forced to be an adult when you're still a child. Um, this is my first book y'all and that's really what this book is about. It's called Mourning My Inner Black Girl Child. And the book is all about my experience as a black girl experiencing adultification, being forced to become a woman when I was just a girl. Um, so I'll share this piece called unprotected innocence and if you if you look at um Micaiah Bryant's hashtag you'll see videos of her doing hair tutorials y'all she was laying her baby hairs she was giving you two puffs and my poem is really about my relationship to my hair and being unprotected so it's it's really um heavy on my heart uh, thinking about her relationship with her hair and her baby hairs and mine and what baby hairs represent uh, for being too grown too soon as a little black girl. So this piece is called Unprotected Innocence for Reese Botts and Reese Taylor. Also give another disclaimer, if you all aren't familiar with Reese Taylor, um, she's a black woman who um, was sexually abused in 1944 and she was actually um, through the process of fighting for justice on her behalf, that's what Rosa Parks did before she did anything else. And so Reese Taylor's case is what launched Rosa Parks into her activism. So I mentioned Reese Taylor in this poem as well. So this is Unprotected Innocence, y'all, for Reese Botts and Reese Taylor. <clears throat> At 13 years old, I was Reese. Reese Taylor and I shared the same name, the same story. In 1944, Reese stood before an all white jury in Henry County to testify against her abuser. In 2004, Reese stood before an all white jury in Henry County to testify against her abuser. In the 60 years between her case and mine, time stood still for Black girls like us. Unconsented sexual terror sanctioned by the state, both her abuser and mine walked free. 
trial one, 2003. It was my very first time wearing my hair natural. Newfound fluffy fall out curls flaunting themselves around my earlobe, locking into each other, loving on my scalp effortlessly. My big sister had them slick to the side, wiggled her three fingers through my kitchen with jam gel, extra hold, had my baby hair swooped and swerving just the way I liked them. The jury didn't like them. The contagious kinks crinkled on top of my untamable mane because baby hairs made brown baby girls look like we grew up too fast, fresh, freaky, fornicating for food and clothes. The way I wore my hair on my forehead made me look like not 13 years old, like I was not deserving of protection. The jury was hung and I damn near hung my girlhood with a noose to the magnolia tree that day. Outside the courtroom, I could hear them say, she doesn't look her age, she doesn't look her age. Trial two, 2004, it was my very first time wearing my hair pressed, curled, sheened, glossed bouncing its own two-step to the step of my straw with a brainwashed head tossed mind of its own kinky curls pressed straight into America's framework of femininity. My big sister ain't know how to press or curl. Mama said she wasn't allowed to lay jam gel swirls to my edges no more. Mama told Sister T from the church to fix her baby's hair for the next court date so I could look professional for the white folk. Mama took me shopping at Macy's for a two-piece suit and penny loafer shoes so I could look respectable for the white folks. In 2003, the jury was hung and my innocence was hung with the noose to the oak tree that day. My mama hung her head low, longing for leveraging tools to protect her baby from this man, this system. But there was no slipping my size six thighs into a proper performance of innocence. The jury, would never like me. The way my booty filled out a hound's tooth pencil skirt, the way my breast cupped a white button down shirt, my abuser was found innocent because the jury could not see innocence between the three fingered waves my big sister styled across my forehead because my body shaped a suit like a woman because girls like me cannot be raped, only tamed, only shamed, only blamed. 1944 to 2004, rest in peace to the innocence of girls who have ever been Reesey in their lifetime, who were too black and too bold for a Henry County courtroom, whose innocence was stolen by a man whose innocence was protected by the law, rest in peace to girls with black girlhoods like ours who never found protection in innocence. Thank you. Mm. 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 Say that. Mm -hmm. I think we have another question in the chat that talks about delivery. It says, what fuels your delivery? I like I write too, but way too shy to share because I feel my delivery won't connect. I don't know if you want to touch on that, Re. Um, but I think you just did a very powerful delivery. So I think that that would. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and before I dive in, I just want to say, you know, like when I talk about like rest in peace to the innocence of black girlhoods like ours, that we never found protection and innocence and that those who abuse us become innocent, but we are left without our innocence as black girls. And so I'm just saying the name of Micaiah Bryant right now, um, because not only did she not have her innocence, she doesn't have her life. Um, and I think to the question about delivery, I feel like, you know, since I was a little girl, I've always like been very soft and sweet. But as soon as I get up on a stage, I just transform. And it's like I felt literally like the power of my ancestors, the power of every black woman and girl who needs to hear what I have to say. Like it just comes over me. And I literally like transition into this other version of myself. And 
I've learned, you know, too, what Zaria also talked about around it just being draining. Like sometimes I don't have the energy to perform my poetry. And I have a poem in here called Performing My Whole Life and just the pressure to perform. And so I just want to encourage y'all, like sometimes you can just share your poems. Sometimes you can just read it. You don't have to feel the pressure to be powerful. And when you do feel, and, and let me correct myself, even when you just read your poem, it's powerful, right? And I grew up with this mentality, especially in the poetry world, that if I didn't, every time I share my poem, if I didn't have it memorized, if I didn't like have every ancestor present with me and be like exerting so much of myself, then it wasn't good. And I held on to a lot of shame to the point where I wouldn't even share anything if I if it wasn't memorized, if it wasn't perfected. And now I'm just at a point where like, I just want to write and share when I feel moved, how I feel moved today, because Micaiah Bryant is so heavily on my heart, I felt her spiritual energy with me. And I think that's what came through just now. And tomorrow, I just might not have the energy to read it the same way. And that's okay, too. And I think just allowing yourself to have grace with your process, and not forcing yourself to be any other than what's natural to you. If you want to speak louder, if you want to come off more, um, intense right like I definitely I'm I'm such a spiritual ancestral person so I really literally channel my ancestors and it's not even a conscious choice at this time because I'm so used to it but like I would encourage whatever that looks and feels like for y'all whatever your spiritual practice is your ancestral practice finding ways to lean into that and channel that in your process of of sharing your work and also just trusting that when your spirit feels moved to share in whatever way is good enough, is beyond good enough, is so powerful and so necessary and so important for folks to hear. I want to add to that if I can. Um, also, as poets, like a lot of us, we, like we said, we have journals of our work or, you know, what maybe old to us, we always have to remember it's okay to read it to a new audience because they never heard it. We've heard it. We know what it is, but just it, it's okay to get into, oh, I got to, some. I just stick with my old poems that I know, well, plus I haven't written anything, but it's okay that I can read to you guys a poem that I wrote 10 years ago because most likely you did not hear me perform that poem 10 years ago. So it'll be new to you. And it's, all, it's like, a, it's like um, in a sense, also like a concert. Um, some artists, they may perform their greatest hits or some will perform newer stuff. It's, it, you know, so making that, you, you won't perform the same way every time as well. So it's, you know, you you think you're going to perform something one day, and then when you get there, you just go back the room or when it was open mic. You kind of be like, mm, I thought I wanted to do this, but I don't want to do that poem. And you'll do something else, too. So it's all about the vibe as well. And just knowing you don't... Um, you can read, the, you can recite your old what, what you consider old. But, yeah. And another thing that I just want to um, reiterate, because we're talking about also just like the element of writing from a place of pain, is that when you perform your poems, you don't have to perform from a place of trauma. You should not have to relive your trauma to make it more palatable. And that was like a really big thing when I was doing um, brave new voices is because there was no mental health workers on duty. And so you have a whole bunch of kids performing these traumatic poems and reliving their trauma and then having no support afterwards and having to figure out how to navigate the feelings that they've re-evoked in themselves because they've poured themselves out on stages. And so it's okay. Thanks, Caesar. It's okay to care about yourself and to prioritize your health over what you think the audience will want. Because sometimes, like we said, you just don't have it to give and that's okay. And so it is okay to perform an older poem or something that doesn't hurt you to perform or something that doesn't re-traumatize you in the process of performing it. Um, and so with that being said to the person who asked that question, this is just your encouragement to perform 
whatever poem you may feel at whatever capacity you may have and the performance will come the message will be delivered in the way that you desire for it to be delivered this is a cameo from my dog caesar who decided that he had something to say <laughs> Um, does somebody want to throw another piece? I could just also add okay. with what you were sharing. Um, so yeah, I grew up in that type of poetry environment as well. Um, so I'm from Philly and I grew up in the Philly youth poetry movement moment. Um, and it was a big... Um, just a, like this huge expectation that if you weren't um, performing your trauma on stage, then you weren't doing it right. And I just want to dispel that myth, y'all. Like we have so much to write about and sometimes all we can write about is our trauma and that's okay, but you deserve support in that, especially as youth, but all of us, when we are writing about our trauma, that's one step to healing. It's not always the totality of our healing. And I just want to encourage us to have access to the mental health support that we need to talk through the heaviness that comes up in our process of writing. Uh, Y'all said that somebody in Unit 5 has a poem that wants to share. Yeah, we're just trying to get a hold of them. Just give us a minute, OK? Hey, little baby. Yeah. yeah, this unit five, I'm going to read a poem. Let's hear it. All right, it's called, uh, now I don't know what it's called, but I got it though. All right. Times I could have lost my life, I sometimes take that for granted. Where I'm from, the grass ain't green. When gunshots echo, we panic. We've seen violence. We've seen poverty. We are violence and we are poverty. We're not seen. No Nobody notices our hurt. We're not seen until we end up in the dirt. Pain, we try to hold our tears together. Afraid when we all fear together. Who can understand? All we want is a relation, black and brown, fighting for what was taken. That's it. That's beautiful. Thank you. Someone, someone else is gonna read some too. <laughs> and what I said is, it's rock and rolling. Rocking and rolling. What have you been drinking? Please let me know. You must be drunk. Going to the house, wandering from street to street. Who have you been with? Who have you kissed? Who face, who face have you been finally? You are my soul, you are my life. I swear my life and love is yours. So tell me the truth, where is that fountainhead that you've been drinking from? Don't hide the secret, lead me to the source. Fill my jug over and over again. Last night I finally caught your attention in the crowd. It was filling my image, filling my dream. Telling me to stop wandering, stop, stop this search for good and evil. I said, my dear prophet, give me some of the drunk Give me some. Give me something that you drunk for essence of your life. If I let you drink, you say any of the burning flames, it will scorch your mouth and throat. Your your potion has been given already by heaven. Ask for more at your peril. I limit it and beg. I desire much more. Please show me the source. I have no fear to burn my mouth and throat. I'm ready to drink every flame <laughs> and more. Hey, right on. Thank y'all for listening. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Much respect. Does anybody have more questions before we throw some more poems out there? One of our viewers wants to read a poem. Her name is Leticia. All right, Leticia, what you got for us? Hi, um, I'm on my phone and it's got low battery. So I'm trying to get that going. 
but I have a poem that's called The Fleeting Shadow. And um, I've been working on it for a few weeks and I just wanna say, I haven't been able to write poems for a long time too. So I feel greatly assured by my other writers that say the same thing. Thank you. This is The Fleeting Shadow. Flying above the morning dawn, I'm looking for my shadow. Not yet do I perceive what often eludes me. I am searching for the sky amongst the cloud up above. I look for dandelions to blow sweet seeds across the horizon. Is it green or is it cold? Is it real or is it memorex? You can't compare, it must be an echo. Worship, worship, worship. The wheels are turning on a dry ocean. The dregs of sand fill my casket. I feel like a fish on land. Take me home to Atlantis and back again. What's real, what's not real, I cannot find it. I'm still looking for my shadow amongst the deep. Come with me and fly upon the sea. I have been there before. Worship, worship, worship. Holy grandma's shriveled hand, fingernails perfect. That's all I have left of her. Holding baby's tiny finger, tiny hand holding my pinky. Hold fast to the memory, it may never be there again. Worship, worship, worship. The Bradford stained glass window in the town of York in Great Britain. My sanctuary shattered in the war. Poppers pulled their pennies together so they could rebuild the cathedral window. Is it real? Is it replaced? sun shines through again. Worship. The sky is green. The glass is blue. My memory fulfills despite my fleeting shadow. Thank you. Uh, that was dope. Okay, which one of you wants to read again? Azaria, how about you? Give me just a moment. Somebody in here is on a phone call, so I'll go after the next person. I'll go, um, if that's all right. <laughs> um, this poem I'm going to do is called I'm a Survivor, and I think this poem is really, um, I wrote this poem for the re-election of President Barack Obama, but it's still relevant because we were, de we're still dealing with voter suppression, and yesterday's verdict is part of overcoming some small changes, holding people accountable, but we also got to know our history again. We have to know where we came from, where they, what they've done to get to where we are now and to know where we, what we got to do to change the system. I'm a survivor of the transatlantic and trans-American slave trade. I'm a partisan survivor of rape and slavery. No choice but to carry my babies into this horrible world my baby being ripped from my womb and arm. My husband, auctioned off a lunch for, for a bell. I know that because of my skin complexion, I was working in the house saying, yes, master, and acting like I was his loyal subject. Yes, his loyal subject, subject to all kinds of abuse. While taking care of his family, I'm learning how to read and write and listen to his conversation to one another. While I wash his clothes outside and pass by the other slaves, I sing, Way in the water to communicate to the other that the water is the key to freedom. I'm a survivor of slaves learning how to read and write. At night, my work is never done. I teach others how to read and write, but I teach them how to hide it so we don't lose the battle to freedom. Certain trees bore strange fruit, and even though they're not grown in front of us, they're grown in someone's backyard. I'm a survivor of the civil rights movement and dogs attacking me because I want to vote. I'm a partisan survivor of the Black Power Movement, Black Panther Party, Power to the People, and Police Brutality and FBI Instigations and Infiltration. I lead a down for a cause and two rappers on two coasts through the cause of war within our communities. They say the best way to hide something from us is by putting it in a book. After all the things I went through to teach us how to read and write in slavery, these two things which are free are becoming useless in our communities. 
I'm proud to be from Oakland and Berkeley, two cities that represent change and revolution. I'm black, not African-American. I don't identify with Africans because I don't know what tribe or region I'm from. Because of the one drop rule, I don't know who I was at first. I refuse to call myself an American because I want to call myself something where the country doesn't even want me. They keep finding ways to keep me oppressed or extinct. We fought hard for the right to vote, but the moment that we earned it, people aren't registering or getting out there. Our right to vote and freedom may be taken away because we're complacent and we don't know if a war will break out just to put it back into slavery. And we've been experiencing institutional slavery and racism for the past 50 years, but it got real when we had a black president and he wasn't backing down. They were afraid that he was gonna change America for the better and they couldn't have it. It became tougher and tougher for us to vote and express ourselves. There may be 99%, but that 1% controls everything. I'm a fighter and I refuse to give up. I learned from all the people that fought for us to be here today, dead or alive. We have the right to live freely. I'm a survivor of all these things because my ancestors built this country and we're being erased out of its history. Pick up a book and learn about the struggles that people went through just for us to be here today. I refuse to let all the movement and those that lay down their life die in vain. Thank you. I guess that throws that to me, but before um, I perform, I did want to ask a question because I had had a conversation with Tyson beforehand, and I just want to check and kind of get, do a litmus test of the room to see what kind of response or if it would be triggering to anybody if I talk about juvenile incarceration in this poem. And so if I could get like some feedback before I throw this poem, that'd be great because yeah, I'm like very concerned about care. I heard a please do. Um, anybody else? Well, I have other poems. I just want to know if this is if this is the poem. That, that's more so my concern. All right, for sure. Um, and here we go. Okay, <laughs> I was trying to listen, but all right, here we go. I am capitalism's favorite son. In both the beauty of brilliant mind, everything in me ain't guilty. Just every iron, iron bone in my body, the concrete under feet colder than the souls that walk above it. Innocent children's many times just product of the systems I before walls, big box, more full than the stomachs of those I encounter, swallow up their hopes of freedom when they open up their eyes. My favorite cut of meat is dark. But how many chickens you gotta kill to get your fill of drumsticks? They give life to beats as I break them down. My metabolism fast, cause white meat don't last, and it cannot fulfill my cravings. I have a peephole. Big enough to see the light of day, but not large enough to let you outshine it. Your intellect is a threat to my existence. If you were not here, you hurt my broken system. I know you was broke, but because of you, I may face demolition, so I will demolish you. I will pick apart the self-pity and replace it with self-hate. My guards will then kill you and call it suicide. You know they murder you at high rates. I got bars for days. Multifaceted narratives run through me. Hard cries run through me. Monochromatic, stifle all ability for imagery. Can't run away from me. I will break your soul. Shatter your spirit and slit your throat with it. I will put shackles on your neck. Spit you out on pavement so you can disintegrate while you work out in the yard. Micromanaged by racist guards, I will ruin you. I'll mask the validity of your claims behind my father's teeth, you know. I'm capitalism's favorite son. My pop's real freaky in the sheets. He ripped the children off the streets. Be the life giver of false hope and foster care to feed me. The reproductive system moves quite quickly. California has built 23 prisons since 1980, but built one university due to pollution, population, manipulation. You don't have to think. I control your mind. You will hate me so much. You will take your own lives. Black bodies are a burden on my big brother. You know, Eddie, the education system, yeah, he can't handle the brilliance, be the breaker of hopes and dreams. Diagnose white kids with everything, but refuse to call them anything but good kid. Never call them ill or guilty or violent or criminal or beast just offer them lots of peace the word white is not heavy on the tongue does not cause the same pit in my stomach when i consume them i consume them then regurgitate them back to society while the chocolate children dead and dismembered decompose inside of me i am the sealed casket and the bones defy gravity i said i am the sealed casket you wait you can't run away from me i got bars for days i will demolish you i am still hungry i am four walls i'm capitalism's favorite son and you you better not forget it. And so 
this poem was more so shared. It was important for me to share this in response to the poem because there was a line that he stated that said that we are violence. And I really think that it's important to highlight and reaffirm kids and let them know like you are not your mistakes. And just because you've made a mistake does not make you irredeemable. And it doesn't mean that you deserve to spend life incarcerated or not be able to navigate different aspects of life in order to grow from your past experiences. And so I really think that that's important for kids to know. And I think that there are other alternatives to incarceration. And this is coming from somebody with a family member who taught for juvenile hall for over 30 years. Um, so I know what that process looks like. I've visited before, I've spoken at juvenile hall before. Um, but I really, it's important for me to tell you as a person who's been tasked with sharing and creatively expressing things that despite the structure and despite the system that you are currently a part of, it does not determine your overall existence. And there are ways to re-enter into the society and there are support structures that exist for you when you get outside of this space. And so I really just wanna hold space for y'all in this moment. Thank you. Thanks, Azaria. Hey, Tongo, how about you? Can you go up again? Mm-hmm. Um. I talk facing away from the dead. They replace me with the change in my pocket. And the penny that's yet to be invented. They say, you have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cut a throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, <laughs> I became content with the small gestures of plantation fires. I mean, Playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. It exists in so many places, so many random things that interrupts me while I'm trying to dream. Like your clay correspondence, Lord. To be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind, explored what's naturally there, and I found no brainwashing. I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diasporic South. I have morning militancy. I mean, windows to the South. I'll walk on a missile for food. I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country I murdered? Merge with us, Lord. A old metal versus new metal. A old metal versus a pool of meandering and peerless faces of multiculturalism of sorts. The dead replace me with a comedian's chest cavity instead of a chest cavity held tight. It takes a violent middle man me to talk to myself stories that travel through other people's stories a song about a song a hemisphere about a hemisphere stories that travel through a conquered poet hey, my mother remembers africa lord she killed on behalf of you lord i wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant i read 1000 books in front of the world what i do is fight poems and sleep through decades in san francisco prayer circles watch people play for post-working class associative surfaces or recreations of a governor's desk ruling class art of utility plan find a sociopathic bureaucrat a day some white people scare even easier TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby wearing ceramic armor, must get prizing fantasizing through the art of the poor. Their trendy latches locked before God, black art hunted down like a dog. And hand over my friends, Lord. Lord, I think I'm gonna die in a war. Unelected white people in my small house, like a blue song of no spiritual effect, a dollhouse age bomb, a pony show near dead bodies, apartheid weddings that go right, apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians, the spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations, a chemical interpretation of a Sunday trip to church, church smells in their pockets, a river mistaken for a talking river, no autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use made in the image of God's trinkets, where white abolitionists confided in their children about. Uh, chemical assurances that they will switch from black artists to white artists, from black God to white God, from black worker to white worker. I think about you cautiously, Lord, in the same way I think about my childhood. Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is mute. A comedian points out a planet's field to a priest king, sugar cane king, cotton king, revolutionary to Bible Central, containing all modes of shallow introduction, introducing an unlisted planet class speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masses that we could figure out our fathers later. You know, a priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of parishioners, re-raveling fantasies about black art, priests reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. You know, after the day, I've never been a poet before. Little brother watches his big brother's friends. They lean rifles on shelter walls. They agree with me and call it literature. It's a simple matter, this revolution thing, to really lie to no one, to keep nothing godlike, to write a poem for God. Tyson, 
you around? You want to pipe in here? I can jump in and do uh, another piece too while we wait for Tyson. If that's cool. Um, mm, thank you, Tongo. Uh, this piece is called I Can't Breathe. I wrote it in 2015 before George Floyd and um, continues to ring true. One, one and then the two and two, two and then the three and three, three and then the four and then you gotta, then you gotta, then you gotta, but I can't breathe. I mean, I physically cannot afford to breathe in brown skin because it's inherently toxic. They say I'm worthless. Cause brown skin is worthless and I can't breathe in this air that you claim was made for me and you don't care because this air was never made for me. Can't you see America what you are doing to me mentally, physically, emotionally, you're killing me. Cock load and shoot, choke hold and boop, you're killing me. I can't breathe. I mean, I guess we was never supposed to breathe here in the first place. I mean, I guess this place was never meant to be our birthplace in the first place, but it's the best place and the worst place for us to be because it ain't nowhere in this world for us to breathe. We've been suffocating in this world since we crossed them seas. We come from a lineage of niggas who wasn't never supposed to breathe, only supposed to breathe. Young Negroes who wouldn't breathe past age 18 and now them same young niggas is killing them young niggas for the American dream. But see, they chasing this high and losing their life until one day they stop and realize that they wasn't never even breathing in the first place. I mean, we wasn't never even breathing in the first place. Can't breathe here, can't breathe nowhere. Somebody tell me where is home? Somebody tell me where am I supposed to go if I can't call this to my America? I might as well take my own breath cause y'all gonna take my breath anyway and dead or alive, I'm not breathing anyway. And then I hear this voice inside of me that's reminding me that we gotta find breath in something. We gotta find life in something and knowing that if he can't breathe and she can't breathe then we can't breathe but we gotta breathe so we can be here. So we can reclaim our space and be free here because we deserve to breathe here. My family, we deserve to breathe here. Can we take a collective breath and breathe here? I wanna invite you to breathe here. Can we breathe in, breathe out? Can we breathe in, breathe out? My family, we deserve to breathe here and we will breathe here and we will breathe here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Re. Let me just uh, ask this question that somebody shared, which is, where is home for you in your poetry? And if maybe each of you could tell us that, and then we're going to have to wrap this up. It's been so awesome. You guys have been so great. And hopefully we'll be able to do more things like this in the future. Ree, you want to start? And then we'll go to Tongo, Azaria, and Joy. Sure. Um... Wow. You know, when I think about home, I think about ancestral home. I think about the African continent, West Africa, not knowing my roots, but knowing that that's really the place from which I began writing poetry, trying to understand my ancestry and then 
trying to understand myself as a black girl in relation to my ancestry. And I talked about being from Philly. Um, you know, Philly really birthed me as a poet. I was originally from Atlanta and I moved to Philly when I was 10. And when I got to Philly, that's when I became a poet. And so just the, the homeland of my poetry was that city that was so creative and artistic. And it was all these black folks who were poets and elders who just reached out to me and invited me into my own voice. And from there, I found home in my own voice. And before that, I really didn't feel at home with myself. I didn't feel at home in my body and at home in my own skin. But I think that poetry allowed me to feel at home with me and therefore gave me a deeper connection and relationship to my ancestral homes and to the city of Philly that, that birthed the, the writer in me. Thank you. Right on. Um. I, I, I would just add, you know, the, the kind, of, kind of what what poetry, um, you know, what poetry kind of reveals um, is is in a is in a way an, an invincibility that you have access to, an invincibility of of um, you know that that just uh, almost uh, really how powerful. Um, how powerful you can be when you expand your your, your um, you know expand your power of definition. You know one of the um, and a greater thinker. This is not original thought, but like uh, some some great um, revolutionary theorists assert have asserted that one of the where, where your humanity, where your liberation really begins is in your power to name things and the first you know the 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 the, the first flicker of, of 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 oppression or what really holds you down or inhibits you is living in a reality in which you are named by others and your world is named by others so poetry is just the, is is how we can reabsorb that power to name things um, on our terms, using whatever we have access to, you know, that's, that's, that's what I, that's, that's what, and that's, that's what I found in there. And that's what I believe is, you know, a universal access. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I got the green light to share one more poem because honestly I don't have a home in poetry I can't answer that question and I I don't mean that just to be like dodgy but also just like I just feel very much so like a nomad when it comes to poetry um and I don't really have a lot of direction in that space beyond what I talked about earlier um so this this is going to be my close out uh for the black men my love cannot protect you are radiant your eloquence is the gun they swear you have when they shoot you. The speed of your tongue, a justification to stand their ground. Your existence is the antithesis of their contentment. For this world is not prepared for your potential to succeed. You are powerful. I wrote Bart today. As I passed Rootville Station, my heart dropped. I thought about Oscar and the bonding his baby girl will never get to experience at the hands of the bondage that took him forever. I thought about the gun and taser clothing synonymous for the oops that follows genocide, dear black man. Your stark white smile shines like the stars and your lips curve like the crescent moon. But every time I see the night sky that is your face, the fear grows inside. You see they shot Mike and Trayvon and Alton and Alva and Paul and Phil, insert name here, they even choked Eric and I don't wanna know what they will do to you. As the bullet penetrates this tissue, I will buy stock and tissue because these tears won't stop and I know you're tomorrow and promise so today. Today, I tell you I love you. I feel that you don't hear it enough. Maybe mamas and MTV and even BET screaming you are inadequate, but you, you are enough. So as you pour yourself out like libations for those you have loved and lost, Black men, remember you need to stand tall. To say that there was no warmth like the warmth of a mother's arms, her love a burning passion for your survival. What does that warmth do for the cold body she caresses? She no longer wears white dresses, then bloodstains don't come out. The bleach didn't burn her skin just like the system didn't burn us and they dare ask, are you a respectable Negro? Are you pleasant enough to only leave a few bumps and bruises when they beat you or are you a beast? 
We break their bones like you break racial barriers and turn them against one another like stiff pages in books you have read. You are intelligent, but how exactly will you use the knowledge in your head to pass the bar whose weight we are crushing under as we wait for social change? Black men, take hold of your sisters. For this patriarchal society means us no good. You make it to your 21st birthday, please celebrate to no end for this is a major life event no other race will understand. Remind your sisters to stand tall. For we are not stepping stones towards liberation. We be the backbone that backs you up when nobody else got you, dear black man. I can continue to carve the words in your, into your eyes with my letter. I can continue to carve the words I love you into your eyes with my eyes. I'm sorry, I'm, this poem is very heavy for me right now. Um, I can continue to carve the words I love you into your skin with my eyes, but I traded my best souls for bullets I would take for you. My crash for chrome knuckles race to the sky and death for deconstru deconstruction of a system that don't want us here. So when you make it to the end of this year, you better remember this letter. If we can only count the number of fatalities and I, I cannot claim your body in the morgue. My cold body may be the one laying right next to yours. They killed Tanisha and Sandra and Rakia and Miriam and Shelly and Diamond and Darnisha. Damn it, the list goes on and I may be next. Black men, my love. What will it take to make them see your worth? I am mourning and in the morning, I am scared you will not be here. Do you hear me or have you silenced me like the rest of the community do? I mean, it's fine if you have, but the only question that remains is if I must speak up for us, where exactly does that leave you? Thank you. Thanks, Azaria. And how about Joy? Hi, and so for me, um, home is music for me um, because Basically, that's what music is. The lyrics is poetry. So for me, I get inspired from listening to other artists. But if you take away the instrumentation and just listen to the words, um, that's poetry for me. Um, Tina Marie, Prince, um, so many artists. Um, even when you listen to uh, Kendrick Lamar, just listening to the words, the lyrics, that is poetry. And, you know, you don't have to be the next, um, just imagine your work could be a, a song eventually. But, you know, that's, that's how I get my poetry. That's where my home is, music. Okay, we've reached the end of our time together. Thank you so much for coming and for speaking and just revealing so many beautiful things. Um, we all appreciate you and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having us and thank you to the people who were listening who also shared and for all the feedback and words of encouragement. It really means a lot to me and I'm sure it means a lot to other poets as well. Mm -hmm. Much love and appreciation, everybody.